morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Caitlin Carlson, and I'm an Associate Director of Donor Relations and Stewardship here at CSU. On behalf of Women in Philanthropy, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the opening session of Gather Conversations to Inspire. For those of you who are new to this community, our mission is to connect and empower a broad community to elevate women in philanthropy at Colorado State University. We recognize the power of women and strive to connect them with their passions at CSU so that through philanthropy, the world's biggest challenges are solved. The purpose of GATHER is to spotlight women in the CSU community, community through a series of conversations so that we can be inspired by their work, their expertise, and their accomplishments. In a year where so many of us have turned to social media to keep in touch with family, friends, and even colleagues, our opening session features alumni who are experts in this field. Now, before I introduce our special guests, I wanna take a moment to address a few housekeeping items. This program is being recorded, so feel free to keep your camera on, or if you're more comfortable, feel free to turn it off as well. That's perfectly fine. And thanks for submitting your questions ahead of time. And we tried to incorporate as many of those as we could into the moderated panel. But we have planned for a few minutes at the end to address anyone, any questions that come up during the program. Feel free to, free to type those into the chat and we'll get to those as we can. Now, without further ado, I'm honored to welcome the special guests who will serve on our panel. Jocelyn Goodroad. Jocelyn is a 2002 CSU graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration with a CIS concentration. Jocelyn has worked in digital advertising sales for almost two decades, including several years at Microsoft where she created and sold strategic advertising programs for a dedicated list of Fortune 500 clients. In order to solve the growing need for a solution to efficiently scale and manage the influencer marketing programs, Jocelyn and two of her former clients founded Find Your Influence, the industry's first all-in-one influencer marketing solution and also a female-owned business in 2013. Today, Jocelyn serves as the EVP of Strategic Partnerships, Business Development and Sales for the Arizona-based organization. Kimberly Stern. With 15 years of experience in strategic digital communications, CSU alumna Kimberly Stern leads Colorado State University's award-winning social and digital media team. She loves the challenge of blending the art and science of creating dynamic and engaging digital content. Maya Siegel. Maya Siegel is an entrepreneur, student, and activist leading purpose-driven work at the intersection of social media and social impact. At CSU, she is studying marketing and entrepreneurship. And finally, our featured presenter, Bree Patterson. Bree is the author of Denver Food Crawls, Touring the Neighborhood One Bite and Libation at a Time, and Bites with Bree, a blog sharing the food stories of Denver. A well-known influencer and blogger, in 2017, Bree founded Vesta Media, a social media and influencer marketing agency. Bree has had many speaking engagements and has appeared at Colorado State University, Denver Startup Week, and Channel 2 News, among others. In her spare time, she enjoys time in the outdoors with her Sheba Doodle and her fiance. Take it away, Brie. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the lovely introduction. Um, and let's begin. Leveraging social media in your career. Thank you everybody for joining me today. Let's get started. According to Career Builder, Survey, 70% of employers use social media to screen candidates during the hiring process. And about 43% of employers use social media to check on current employees. The first thing I recommend doing is Googling yourself, literally. Just get on there, look, in, look at what your name could pop up or what it brings up. Um, look at the photos, identify where they're hosted. We'll talk about um, what to do in the next slide, but if you need to clean house, think about it this way. If you were run, running to be the president, what could be used against you that's on social media? These are things that people will look at 
uh, hiring managers or other people within um, the hiring realm, such as a CEO or the person you might direct report to. Um, and then also think about it as what would you include if you were to write a memoir about yourself? Here's an example of how I Google myself. So first off, I'll note that you want to be in incognito mode so that you have no influence on what's actually being shown. Type your name slow to see what comes up and then add a location. And then you want to just scroll through. And one of the things I'm not going to do on this, but just to give you a heads up, you should go to page two, if not even page three. You can see all of the different places that you've been seen. Um, and then check those sources. Next, you'll want to check the, the photos. There's obviously photos of me on this page, but you'll see that there's also photos of other people named Brie Patterson or people that come up when I Google that. So you can see over there, there's someone. And then let me just find someone to click on for you. But if you see something that you don't necessarily like, oh, here's one. This is not me and I don't know who that is, but it's someone else that's named Brie Patterson. If it was a photo of me that I find incriminating or something that I don't want to be out there, the best thing to do would be to contact the, um, the web developer or the, the owner of that website and ask it to be removed. Um, from there, you can usually negotiate something a little bit uh, that, that's in your favor. So claiming your platforms. Once you've done your Google analysis of yourself, seen where you are, what, what's out there about you, and maybe there's nothing that's even better, you're gonna wanna start putting things out there so that people have a way to find you. So claim your platforms. First thing you're gonna wanna do is, is to find a domain for your name. And that can be anything as your first and last name. So I own BriePatterson.com. Um, if that's, for example, if that was your name or you have a really common name, you can also do last.first, first.last, or um, even instead of doing .com, you could do .co, .net, .dev if you're a developer, .author if you're a writer. Different things are out there for those .com alternatives. Um, and then if someone does own your name and they're not active, so if someone else owned BriePatterson.com and I didn't have access to that, the simple thing to do is to reach out to them and say, hey, I see, saw that you haven't used this for a while. Can I buy this domain off of you? And most likely someone's going to say, sure, here's a price. So I would say expect to, uh, to have a price attached to it. But um, if, the, if they're not willing to do it, go with a variation. It's not the end of the day if you can't have that full domain. And then what platform should you be on? So um, the first three on this, Facebook, Twitter, uh, oh, sorry, the first two, I would say are very important, Facebook, Twitter, and then also being on Instagram and most important would be LinkedIn, especially looking at a career platform. So let's dive in on Instagram and Facebook because these are the two I find that are most people are on socially and aren't necessarily looking at it in a career sense. So hello world, my name is. The first thing you want to do is, is have a captivating bio. You're going to want to use your name, a specialty, career interest, and then if you have hashtags that are relevant to what you're doing, you're going to want to use that and always, always link to that e-portfolio or that website that you have that showcases more about you. And then um, let's look at just a couple of these. So these are three people that I pulled offline. Um, so you can see for Coding Blonde, her name is Masha and she um, says community for women in tech. And so if you look up anything, women in tech, women tech, her name's gonna pop up. And that's why it's important to have that information in your bio. Also for Kate, she says she's a realtor, she's located in Denver. So if someone's looking for a Denver realtor, or they just want to see, they know, oh, Kate just applied to our, um, our overhead real estate company. Let's see what she has for her social media. And then um, I'm showcasing Jackie Carr because she is an entrepreneur, but also at the same time, she isn't just on Instagram, she's on Facebook too. And she crosses everything over from one platform to the other. But you can see in her highlight covers, all of their highlight covers, 
they're sharing what's their passion. They're sharing what they're knowledgeable about. So especially things like ways to help mental health. Um, and then you can also give like a, a sneak peek or a behind the scenes of what you have going on in your life so that people get more of an idea of what your, uh, your pe personality is like outside of just your career work. And then one thing to note, if your page is private, <clears throat> An employer cannot access that through any sleuthing tools. It's illegal. However, if someone that is friends with you was to share a post or share something that you said, that's not illegal. So when you're, when you're posting to any of your social platforms, that's something to keep in mind is who's following you. And, and I mean, the first rule is always to put positive information out there and not anything incriminating. But if it was incriminating, just realize that that could go against you if someone was to share that information with a um, with the place you're employed, but they technically can't go look if it's pr uh, private. So if you do have a private platform, my my recommendation is to create a professional platform or a professional account in addition to your private account. So planning your posts. Let's talk a little bit more about your posts. So really what you're doing is you're a storyteller of your own life. And when I had spoke about, you know, how are you going to create your memoir? This is it. So you really want to utilize your photos, your videos, your boomerangs, or even reels. Um, set up the scene, use people, use props, use good lighting, and then just go for it and be as authentic as you can. Next, you'll want to determine the captions and ensure that it fits with your voice. So things to consider the number one would be your tone and then how you're going to word that. And using your tone is really what's going to say, hey, this is how this person speaks professionally. This is how this person speaks every day. So if you really want it to mock who you actually are. Uh, don't try to sound extra um, smart on something that you might not actually know much about. Uh, you really want to be an expert in what you already know. And then you can always add hashtags and emojis. Emojis are very um, professional for specific platforms, so Instagram and Facebook, um, and then tag any relevant accounts. But really, this is all about who are you, what do you represent, and what do you want? What do you want people to know, and what do you want to tell people? So before you post, always review everything that you do and make sure, this is just a little pro tip, that before you post, you have your set of hashtags ready, which we'll talk about in just another slide. But you really want to have those hashtags ready to comment in your first comment within one minute of posting because that's how people are going to find you. Um, the faster you do that, the, the better your chances are of going uh, more, more uh, on the For You page or the Explore page. So let's talk about the perfect post. Here you can see an example of one of the posts that I've done in the past where I've tagged um, the location, use a well-lit photo. Then, um, so the location's tagged over in the caption, but also it's tagged in the photo. And then I tag relevant accounts that I want to see this. So because I'm a food, this is on my food blogger account, I'm tagging local magazines so that they can see those. And then also places like Visit Colorado, Visit Grand Junction, Visit Palisade. Those are more important. So I put them off to the side um, just so that people that are looking um, to see what's happening there and the Palisades can say, oh, well, let's check visit Palisades and this photo would pop up. And then I utilize the first comment for all of my remaining hashtags that aren't important in those first couple hashtags. If you're going to use hashtags in the first, in your actual caption, my recommendation is to use up to five hashtags and no more than that. So you can see I've only used four or three in this uh, in this post. And then that leaves me an additional set of hashtags for down below. Then let's talk about stories, or sorry, your aesthetic. <laughs> so plan, plan, plan. Here's an example of a client I used to work with. And this was the, the picture on the left is the picture that they had before working with them. And then the picture on that bottom right is when we were working together. Um, so you really want to start with a cohesive look. You want to pay attention of how you're posting, what it looks like when you're posting. So there's lots of apps out there such as Later, 
Planoly, um, and we can leave a list of those in the con in the chat box for you guys. But those posting platforms will give you a look of what your posts will look like as you're posting them. So you can upload a bunch of photos and say, oh, I want my aesthetic to look a specific way. I want it to be like a food, a drink, food, drink, food, drink, or me, work information. We'll go into a few more in a second. But um, one of the things you can do is take multiple photos at a time and then use those every other couple of posts because that will also bring in that overall cohesive look that's more appealing to the eye. And one of the things you can do also is use Canva or InDesign for templates, for um, overlays so that all of your photos have that same hue. Uh, if you're not super techie and using something such as like Photoshop or Lightroom. So here's just another example. These are both of the ladies that were on one of the first pages that I showed you. Um, and you can see that these are more career driven. So the one on the left, she's, uh, you know, she's the realtor again, and she's showcasing different ways that represent her, what she's interested in, but also she hits on the real estate market throughout multiple posts. And then over there, you can see Coding Blonde again, Masha. She's giving tips that she's knowledgeable on. So she's showing her expertise. She's showing her that she's fun. She shows her workspace and how she works. And then she just gives some personality by using other uh, tweets going out there. So hashtags, this is something I said we would talk on. Hashtags are pretty important when you're using a using them in a social post. So to identify good hashtags, you want to see what other people are using. What are the most popular hashtags? You don't have to use the number one, but you want to find out if you're on the right track. Um, so how to find a hashtag. That's really simple. You can, on say Instagram, you can just look up uh, hashtag Fort Collins, and then you can say, um, at the top, it will show, show you what other hashtags are trending in Fort Collins. And so that gives you an, an example of about five to 10 different hashtags right there. You don't have to use all of those, but it's a great start. Um, you can also Google something such as real estate hashtags or whatever is very specific to your career and just Google them and, and you'll get an idea of what's out there. I would cross check with Instagram to make sure that they're popular on Instagram as well. And then one of the things I do is rotate hashtags for groups. So here's an example of um, different ones that are, you could create. Um, so if you're in the PR agency, you could even take um, half of this list. If you don't want to use all 30 hashtags, you could take half of this list and say, today I'm going to use the first five and tomorrow I'm going to use the next five. And then the third day I'll use the next five. This is um, hypothetically if you were posting every day. If you're not posting every day, then I would have just two different sets of hashtags, um, but make sure that they are relevant to your post. If you post something such as um, zoo, like animals at the zoo, just because that's the trending thing, someone, you know, it's all over the news stuff and you're like, oh, I just wanna be trending too. It's not gonna do any good for your post. So make sure it's always relevant to what you're actually posting. And then number of hashtags, I know I mentioned 30 before. So Instagram, um, <clears throat> you can do three max per caption or five, and then follow up with the, the follow up with your first comment with up to 30, unless you use three, then you want to do 27. Um, so you get a total of 30 per overall post. And then for Facebook, I would not recommend doing more than three just because people don't use hashtags as much through Facebook. So let's talk about stories. Instagram stories, um, so when I had talked about the highlight covers earlier of being knowledgeable of things, you can share things such as professional tips. So here's an example of um, Coding Blonde and, and what she used. And these are, you know, this is just one of her highlight stories. She had, I think, like seven different highlight covers. And then you can also show your interests. So this is back to Kate, the realtor. She's showing she likes cats and she likes puzzles. And then you can also do activities. So uh, Kate's also showing that she likes to hike and it gives you more of an idea of things she does outside of the office. And then motivation, alignment, things that really speak to you, quotes that speak to you. This is a great example just to show people that, you know, you're not just 
out there, you're out there trying to make a difference by sharing great information. So this is something Jackie, Jackie shared with her crew. So when you're making a story, you want it to be the perfect story. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Let your story tell a story. Again, you're the storyteller of your own life. So you really want to nail down what you're doing. You can use stories for a sneak peek, share something exciting, behind the scenes content, something that's gonna cause intrigue and bring your audience to your most recent post. So when you do a post, you can usually follow up with, you know, one to three stories, if not more. If you're on vacation, just go crazy with your stories. If it's just one thing of say, you camping, you could just show one, one photo. So again, you're gonna wanna tag the location, tag any brands. So here you can see Campground of Americas is tagged on this photo of the, of the little cabin. And then it's same where that location is. And that's because when people are say in Jackson, Ho Jackson Hole, then they can see what other people are doing there and get some ideas and say, oh, I, I'm not in Jackson Hole, but I'm searching Jackson Hole just to get an idea of what activities there are. This sounds great. Let's go to Campgrounds of America. And then you really want to keep your font consistent per frame. So on the fajita pay or on the Cinco de Mayo post on the on the right side, you can see that I've tried to keep all of the font the same. Um, I've changed up the colors just to kind of draw your eye to different locations that I wanted you to to pay attention to. Um, but then you can add emojis and gifs whenever appropriate. Things you can do to switch up your story aesthetic is to use boomerangs, a photo, or a video. And if you do do a video, always make sure that there's no sound unless it's necessary. So, you know, sometimes someone might be talking in the background and, and that could reflect poorly on you of what that person might say. And it's not necessarily your say, something you're saying or aligned with, but it just might be something that's caught in conversation as you're filming that. So really pay attention to uh, what, what the sound is in the video. So let's talk about LinkedIn. We've talked about social platforms, but let's get more into the career aspect of social media. Dear hiring manager, my name is. So as you can see here, I'm viewing my profile as an anonymous person just to see what's available for other people to see. So my bio shows my name, all of my career specialties, a link to my website, which you can see over on the right-hand side. It gives a quick little background Here's the company I work for. Here's where I went to college. Yeah, Grammys. And, and then make sure LinkedIn does a really good job when you're not, in, when you're in your own profile view to make sure that your profile is complete. The importance of that is just so that it has everything from your work samples to um, just showing what your interests are. So let's go a little bit further into activities on LinkedIn. So one of the things you can do is go to linkedin.com slash feed slash follow. It will show you different people you can follow. Um, it gives you an idea based on what you're already doing, but it also, someone can click on your page and see all of this activity of what you're doing. So it's really important to make sure that you're doing your best on LinkedIn. And that's things from on, on the right-hand side, you can see I've I'm commenting on this CEO's post about, you know, his new, his new news. And I'm saying congratulations to you and the bird call team. One thing to consider is if you're job searching and you say, say I was to write on this person's post, like, oh, thanks for the notifying us that this job opening is available. I'd love to work for company X because of X, Y, and Z. Well, then if I go and apply to company Y, company Y might see that I said that same thing to company X. So it's really important that if you are gonna say, hey, I'm interested in this role, you wanna make that more personalized of why and don't use that when you go to write to the next company. Um, but this is a really great way to, for a, a um, hiring manager to see what other jobs you're applying for or if you're even active, of if you're commenting on other people's posts. The other thing is, you really want to pay attention to the different hashtags you're following on LinkedIn. So I'm following influencer marketing, social media, digital marketing. If someone was curious about what I'm interested in, they're going to know those are my career interests. So find things that align with what your career is about. And then um, check your network. Your network's going to show the people that you follow as well as the um, 
so these these could be anybody from motivational speakers. I put the follow fresh perspectives photo down there just to give you an ex an example of different people you could follow, um, as well as the the businesses that align with you. So if you love volunteering or you're really passionate about the ocean, things like that, and you talk about that, say in your cover letter, those are things that you're going to want to add onto your social media as well and say, hey, I follow Sustainable Ocean Alliance and I'm applying to this nonprofit because this is why I'm interested in it. And it kind of gives it a perspective of what you're doing outside of just your cover letter, just your resume. Um, but also, even if you are in your career, it gives other people an idea. If you say there's a recruiter looking at your profile. Um, and then moving on to the companies that you want to work for. This is really important. If you're trying to get a job at a certain place or you work at a place, you should definitely be following your company and, and commenting on their activities. So in conclusion, be like Dolly. She has her LinkedIn style, she has her Facebook style, her Instagram, and then just jokingly her Tinder style. If you feel that you um, align with certain things, make sure that you showcase that through your digital profile. And always, 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 Go back and check on your digital analysis because that can change at any time. So every time you're applying for a job or you want to make a speech or anything important, go ahead, Google yourself and figure it, figure out what's out there about you because it can always be changing. Thank you so much. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, please reach out. Caitlin, back to you. Awesome, Bree. Thank you so much. Super relevant, super practical information. I hope those of you who are uh, with us today can take away something. I know I certainly did. So thank you again, Bree. A couple of questions that came in through the chat, if you have just a moment to address. Um, where do you find the web developer or contact information if you'd like to remove a photo from the internet? That came in from Candace Mathiason, who happens to be one of our Women in Philanthropy Development Council members. Awesome. K uh, Candace, yes. So at the bottom of every website, they normally will name their, uh, their web developer down there or use the contact us on their page if they don't have it. You can also see if they have a privacy policy on their page. So that's something as, as simple as say Brie Patterson in, in the Google thing, I would write briepatterson.com, but space it out and say privacy policy. And it will say who to contact on that information because not all privacy policies are active on the page. Like they don't have their own link to it. It's usually hidden. So um, I highly recommend doing that. Perfect, thank you. And then one more, um, Trish asked, should you slightly bury your hashtags, meaning you like hard return and then start your hashtags. Um, this is a little bit above my head, so hopefully you understand what Trish is, yeah. is asking. <laughs> so you can you can bury them slightly with the the five dots or dashes, or even in that in your caption if you want to go as far as that and skip the first comment. But it it really it doesn't matter. Sometimes people look at those hashtags just to see that your interests in a professional way, but in a social way, I would say it, it doesn't matter at all. So. Perfect, thank you. All right, we are going to shift gears to our moderated panel, and I would love to hear uh, from our other experts in the field who are joining us today. So let's start with Jocelyn. Jocelyn, can you tell us about how you got into working in social media and a little bit about uh, what you're doing now? Certainly, so um, I, after graduating at CSU, I ended up um, going to the IT field and quickly learning that I was a bit more of a social creature, so quickly found my way to digital advertising sales. And so worked at Microsoft Advertising um, for about six years. And um, as we kind of, as I was working in that field, social media just started to explode at that point. Um, and so I was actually approached by two of my clients at the time um, to uh, basically find a solution of how our how advertisers can quickly work with people that have a large social media presence and or blog presence. We actually started our company back in 2013, way before the word influencer was a household name, way before Instagram had really taken off. And we were primarily working with the mommy bloggers of the world. So really kind of just um, a natural transition from digital advertising sales, which you're talking about more of like search ads and banner ads across different publishers 
to a new sort of content uh, based advertising, which is essentially what influencer marketing is. So we quickly saw the shift from, you know, digital advertising to social media advertising and also having the content play with bloggers to create more of SEO value across different channels. So um, really, really kind of just was a shift in the marketplace. And we took advantage of that shift and created our company very early on so that we could create a marketplace where influencers could um, find advertisers to work with and vice versa. Awesome. Thanks for that bit of background. Super interesting career path. And um, I think I, I, as I was reading a bit about your background, it's just fascinating to see how you wound your way to where you are now. So thanks for sharing a bit about yes, that. Yes, of course. Uh, Kimberly, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing a bit about your background, how you got work, got into working in social media and what you're doing at Colorado State right now. Sure. Let's see. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, well, yeah, I, I, um, I'm a Colorado native and I'm a proud two-time alumna from CSU. I earned my degree, um, my undergrad degree from CSU in the journalism department and then my MBA. And um, I've really had the great opportunity to grow my career in social media, um, starting at the university as internship um, as a student to today um, directing and leading my own team. So I am the director of social and digital media here at Colorado State. I oversee the university's central social media photo and video teams. My shop is responsible for uh, leading the university's social strategy, managing the flagship accounts, and we do house the um, professional video videographer team and campus photographers. Um, my career has been similar to the other panelists have um, really followed the trajectory of social media as a way, like the rise of social media and in the way society communicates and connects. Um, my first job right out of um, school as an undergrad was on CSU's public relations team and I was hired as uh, the new media specialist. At that time, um, Facebook was only, gosh, two years old at that point. And um, that, those, that was back in the days where you had to have a university email account to even log into Facebook. So uh, being a freshly um, minted grad, um, I, I really had the opportunity to dig, in, dig into Facebook and help um, build from the ground up the university's um, various social media presences over the course of, the course of uh, over a decade, yeah, 15 years. Um, a broad overview of my team's portfolio of responsibilities uh, includes creative storytelling, brand journalism, customer care support, and community management, and then of course digital marketing and SEO. Turn it back over to you, Candice, or Caitlin, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, those of us who remember Facebook, uh, Facebook way back in the day can relate to uh, re the requirements to have that .edu email address, so uh, flashbacks of what what things used to be like. Um, somebody who might not remember what that was like is Maya. So Maya um, would love to hear your perspective and how you got into working in social media and um, what your experience has been like since um, some of us are just a bit older than you are. Uh, share share with us what what that's been like for you, and then a bit about how you utilize that in. Um, your future career, your current career, things like that. Sure. So I have always loved community service. And in high school, I spent years volunteering at the Seniors Resource Center in my hometown. But when I moved to college, that work wasn't possible anymore. And I was really passionate about continuing the community work. And I ended up looking to the digital space where I came across a student who went to UPenn and he was founding an international movement um, or an international organization, better yet, called Think Ocean. So we started talking and he eventually asked me to join his team as a volunteer and I did. So Think Ocean became my first exposure to the impact that people can have on the world, specifically young people. And so I spent two years there as the secretary of the board helping Think Ocean become a nonprofit 
and building our Gen Z network. And then through that experience, I found an even larger network of Gen Zers who were creating these unpaid leadership opportunities through their social impact passion projects via, you know, the digital space. And most notably was Gen Z Girl Gang, where I became the social media manager and scaled that community by 10.6K in 18 months. So after that, and you know, through these unpaid experiences, I really gained um, the performance metrics as well as the experience to start doing paid, paid digital strategy work for small businesses and eventually Fortune 500 companies. And honestly, the rest is history. I now work for Bumble, Juve Consulting, which is a digital Gen Z consulting firm and Google. And I'm a freelance website designer as well. And most of the work I do supports the needs of Gen Z leaders like myself, because I found a niche where a lot of my friends were really accomplished, were looking for a website, but couldn't afford thousand, a website that would cost thousands of dollars to code. So I filled that space. Um, and honestly, now most of the clients I get are through social media. They just direct message me. I don't actually have to do marketing for that. Um, and I think that's, I think that's about it. I use social media every day. It's a great way to leverage, you know, opportunities or find opportunities. Um, but I also think it's important to have a balance between, you know, social media and my personal life. I like to remember that, you know, even without social media, I, you know, have other things going, you know, my social media presence doesn't reflect everything about me. Unbelievable. Thanks, Maya. Uh, appreciate you sharing um, some inspirational words about what you've already done um, and you haven't even gotten your degree yet. So congratulations. Um, Bree, I think you have something in common with Maya. So share a bit about more about your background um, and then we'll, I guess, officially transition into the, um, the prepared questions. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I actually just kind of fell into social media. It wasn't something I was planning on doing. I graduated in 2010 with my degree in the hospitality industry, um, and I thought I was going to open up a wellness resort, and one day I just really had an interest. I mean, I always had an interest in food, so I was always posting about food, sharing photos, and um, at the time, Instagram had just came out, and so I was like, this is fun to just post food photos. And now I have a digital camera on my phone rather than carrying around a camera. And, and so it really just kind of happened. And as social media was growing, I was keeping up with the trends. And from there, it just, you know, unfolded for me. And eventually it got to the point where people were asking me to freelance for them and teach them social media because they were seeing the success I was having through my Bites with Brie account. And that's kind of what launched Best of Media, my company. And so now I just uh, freelance for people. I also freelance uh, underneath other companies as well. And really it's just been an evolution of social media. Perfect, thanks for sharing that, Brie, appreciate it. So back to Jocelyn, um, Jocelyn, you already alluded to this, but um, influencer marketing has become a new buzz, buzz word, buzz phrase, I don't even know. Uh, something buzzy. And some people aspire to be a social media influencer, but they can sometimes get a bad rap. Um, how would someone get into being an influencer should they want to be? And what are the pros for a company to be involved with them? Yep. Um, well, I would say, you know, any, any career, you can get a bad reputation. If you don't show up for your job, if you don't perform, so the same goes for being an influencer. Um, I do think it's an exciting time to be part of an industry that's primarily led by women that didn't exist while you know, a lot of us were in college. And while we're still kind of working through the pay gap of equality across many career paths, we're in an industry here that is really primarily led by women and we're crushing it. So I think it's an excellent opportunity for take people to take advantage of. Um, when you're becoming an influencer, essentially the whole goal is to have an exchange of value with your audience. So whether that's being making them laugh, providing business advice, providing personal advice, being a friendly voice, you have to determine what sort of your brand is and what that value exchange is going to be first and foremost for your followers. 
and creating a brand that appeals to them and is truly authentic about who you are. Once you sort of build that following, and have that relationship with your followers, there's tons of resources online, including our own platform, where you can sign up to be an influencer, no matter how many followers you have, and start working with brands either on a product exchange basis for creating content, or as you grow your following, even to be on a paid basis. Um, you know, I'm going back to kind of the end of the question. So the pros of being involved with an influencer for a company, I mean, it, they're influential, they're giving you advice, they're authentically endorsing a brand product or service. And so, you know, it's really, it, it's a word of mouth advertising, which we used to talk about as the most powerful form of advertising, but now it's all over the internet. And it's our, you know, it's the biggest uh, thing, it's a, it, you know, social media is where majority of people spend a lot of their time. And so word of mouth marketing has really taken on a whole new form there. Um, but I think it's an amazing chance for people to be able to start their own career, to use their own voice and personality, to appeal to audiences and, and build that relationship. And companies are going to take advantage of working with people who are authentic and really have that engagement with their following. Um, that's really the key to be successful as an influencer, but there's a ton of resources online to grow your followers. Highly encourage just, you know, doing the, you know, Googling that, but also there's plenty of platforms where you can start working with brands immediately. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, great perspective on how women are leading um, the charge in this space too. So thanks for bringing that up. What a great opportunity um, to kind of level the playing field, uh, so to speak. Kimberly, um, can you talk a little bit more about what it's like being uh, involved in social media for such a large institution like Colorado State? And conversely, do you like keeping your own social media and maybe some of the, the differences that those two um, things present? Sure, that's a great question, Caitlin. Um, I would say every day working for a large institution, um, doing social media in particular brings its challenges and its opportunities, right? Um, I am personally very proud to work for CSU. I uh, deeply believe in the mission, CSU's mission to provide access to a quality education. And therefore I find my work to be really meaningful. Um, and I will say working at a place like CSU, there are endless story opportunities I mean, with all the nooks and crannies of campus, there's always, always something going on. Um, you know, during the pandemic, um, there's absolutely been an increase in folks turning to digital platforms to stay informed about um, the status of university operations, programs. Uh, it's been a challenge, but also a good opportunity for my team to um, provide updates about the university's operational status and beyond in a timely and relevant fashion to social media. Um, further, you know, this is a time where my photo and video team, um, they've been able to be out on campus capturing photo and video um, during a time when folks really can't come to campus and visit. So then what we can do is take those visuals, turn them around and share them on digital platforms um, and bring CSU to people as they're scrolling through their devices. So um, that's been, that's always been part of our role, of course, as a social media team, but I think even more so during the pandemic when there is isolation, this quarantine, how can we bring something familiar to people's devices and create this idea of um, like digital togetherness? As far as um, my own personal accounts, I do have them, but I'm not, I don't really actively post to them. Um, and that's primarily because my head is so much in that brand space so often that I, I need time to kind of disconnect from social media too. And so um, I, I really don't spend a ton of time posting my own content, but I mean, I do, I've, I got little kids. And so of course you gotta like, post an Instagram of your cute kids every now and again. Um, and then I do, I really do like Twitter and LinkedIn from a professional development, professional networking um, capacity. And I am more active in that space um, just with my role at the institution. Turn back over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Kimberly. That was, um, again, great perspective. And 
I think in this time, especially people are craving those images of familiarity, anything that kind of connects them back with um, things that they are used to or, or are missing right now. So thanks for all your great work and bringing campus to our, our community, even if it has to be virtually at this point. So much like we are today. Um, Maya, next question is for you. And you haven't even graduated yet, but you have already used and are using social media in several different ways. You started your own web design company, have gotten many job opportunities through your online network, and even started um, an activism with Gen Z online community, um, the space to speak that you mentioned earlier. How did you know to get kind of involved in all of this? And what advice would you give those looking to do the same or similar? Well, as I previously mentioned, I am fortunate to be part of an incredible online network of young advocates and entrepreneurs. In terms of the opportunities that I've had, the majority were ones that I actually created for myself versus applied for. For example, I became the social media manager by DMing the founder with a full website draft for GGG um, because I was so inspired by their work and she loved it. And asked me to join their leadership team. So my advice for others, and especially if there are any digital natives here, would be to think about your passions and think about how to leverage social media to voice those passions. If you love fashion, you could start a thrifting account or you could become a fashion blogger. Um, social media is incredibly powerful, especially as a way to network. And it also can be incredibly lucrative if that's the goal, you know, influencers make can make thousands of posts without even being famous. And opportunities for jobs and things really exist every day and you can find them as long as you know where to look. And the last thing I would say is it's really important to remain authentic. And I think one way is by finding the platform or platforms that work for you. If you don't like creating videos, then don't, you know, you don't have to use TikTok. In the digital strategy work that I do for companies, I always advise them to leverage the platforms that make sense to them. So for me, I use LinkedIn and social media or <laughs> Instagram as my forms of social media the most. And that's just because I'm not a fan of TikTok in terms of being a creator, but I love to be vulnerable on Instagram. So my that would be my best advice to just find your passions and then find the platforms that make sense for you. Thanks, Maya. I think if we could summarize this entire program into one uh, phrase, it would be create your own opportunity, which you have demonstrated over and over. So thanks for um, reiterating that. Jocelyn, there was a question that came in through the chat that I'd love uh, you to speak to. It's what advice do you have for small companies that are looking to build their brand and don't have film or video teams? Can a brand be an influencer? A brand can definitely be an influencer, um, but, you know, if you don't have video or, you know, uh, or any kind of assets or budget, it's influencer marketing, leveraging influencers themselves on a product exchange basis or service exchange basis is really where a lot of our small businesses get started. Um, so definitely you want to make your own, you know, social media presence as a brand and influencer, so to speak, because you want that to be its own personality and you want to have, you know, that relationship with the followers. But it's a huge opportunity right now, especially to get involved with those nano or micro influencers with really small following who are just up and coming and really are trying to work with smaller brands to get their own kind of foot in the door. So, you know, there's brands that are trying to get their foot in the door with influencer marketing and there's influencers trying to get their foot in the door with brands and platforms like ours, which there's, you know, more than just ours, I'm not trying to just sell ours out there, but there's a lot of marketplaces where you can connect with just those right people that you can afford or that are, you know, like I said, you're just exchanging your product and you get a, a piece of content that you can then use that to power your own social media. Also, if you um, make sure and it, get the rights to the content to share it across your own social, you also can potentially get the rights to turn that into a paid advertisement across Instagram and Facebook. So the content value of getting an influencer to create a high quality piece of, you know, photography 
you know, posted to their followers, you can utilize that piece of content in a ton of different ways that, you know, is exponential in value. Um, think of that as a free advertisement that you had created. You can repurpose that ad. You can get the rights to that ad to share it across, you know, your, you turn that into a paid advertisement. So anybody who's getting started in a small business, in my opinion, if you're just dipping your toe into advertising and getting those assets, influencer marketing is really a huge benefit you know, across the board from creating assets to getting the, the followers to, you know, you name it, it, it's a really inexpensive way to get started. So yes, they want to create a personality with their brand itself, but it's not super expensive to get started with working with these smaller influencers and their huge, you know, value in the assets that they create long-term. They're always around. You always have that photographer, you know, that uh, asset to repurpose whenever you want to. If that makes sense. Super. Thanks, Jocelyn. Again, very practical, very informative. <laughs> um, thanks for your expertise there. Oh. Bree, um, let's shift it back to you for um, what could be our final question, depending on uh, um, how long how long this one takes. But what does the future of social media and digital marketing look like post pandemic? Do you see specific individuals or industries shifting their strategy as the future unfolds? Yes. So I think that social media and digital marketing will always be important. If anything, it's never going away. It's just going to evolve. So staying on top of the new and trending platforms is going to probably be the most uh, beneficial for your company or for you as an individual. Perfect. Nice and Succinct. Love it. Yeah. Um, so another question, again, that has very real world practical applications that was submitted ahead of time. Which of the, so this is for you, Brie, uh, which of the social media platforms are the best to learn and maintain? And does this change dependent upon your area of expertise? Yes. So I would say for your career, definitely LinkedIn and being able to navigate it. Anytime that there's updates with LinkedIn, I would check them out and see what what has evolved there. Um, and then for personal, or if you're going into the, the digital space um, from, with your career, I would say having basic knowledge of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are really great. And then as new platforms come up, such as TikTok is gaining more, um, more attraction. But it, like Maya said, if it's not your interest, then don't, you know, you don't have to bother with it, but just staying on top of any new platforms that are coming out. Um, because one might take over the other one for one day. Awesome, thank you. I think we'll squeeze in uh, one final question and then if um, there are any remaining questions, please feel free to type those into the chat and we can pass those on to the panelists for personal follow-up. Um, but one final question for you, Kimberly, and I know you've got to jump off. Uh, how do you contact or position yourself with organizations or people you'd like to work with, but you're still below their radar? Yeah, I think this is a great question. And when I love hearing Maya's story and understanding that she reached out through DMs to the founder CEO and landed that, that job, that's huge. I think it, it comes down to paving your own path, right? And if you want to get on a company's radar, doing the research um, into the organization uh, and understanding, um, like really finding the exact individual that you can A, send a personalized LinkedIn message to. Uh, LinkedIn is very huge. And to, to tap onto what Brie was just talking about, navigating that space is um, very helpful in a professional networking um, you know, capacity building standpoint. Sending a personalized message via um, LinkedIn or sending an email too. An email still is a really uh, effective way to get in front of somebody. And even after you've done your research, um, and you identified an exact individual at the organization that you want to connect with, giving them an introduction to who you are, why you're interested, and um, asking them if they're not the right person that they, you should be connecting, if they could be a bridge for you to connect with another person within that organization. And then finally, once you do kind of land either, you know, by connecting via LinkedIn or by email, um, don't hesitate to ask that person if they would be interested in connecting via Zoom for a virtual, um, a virtual session. I think that you'd be surprised at how many people really are willing um, 
to give of their time and of their expertise um, as long as you've done your research on the back end. It can really articulate, you know, what your goal is from the outcome of a conversation. Perfect. Thanks, Kimberly. I think it comes back to what Maya stated so beautifully earlier, which is to create your own opportunities. So um, with that, I want to thank all of our uh, presenters today. Bree, Jocelyn, Kimberly, Maya, thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise um, in being with us today and sharing some really empowering and inspiring words uh, for those of us who are not so digital savvy, but maybe want to, and those of us who want to utilize this for uh, personal and professional growth. So, so thanks again. Um, and what a great kickoff to our Gather programming. Just a reminder that we'll be hosting a session tomorrow that explores the complexities of parenting while pursuing a degree. That session will be at noon tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, join CSU President Joyce McConnell and several extraordinary women in key leadership roles for a candid conversation about how they approach leadership and what they hope for the future of CSU. That session is on Wednesday at 4 p.m. The confirmation email that you received this morning has information on how to access these sessions and we hope that you will join us. Thanks again for being with us today. We hope to see you for future Women in Philanthropy programming, if not tomorrow or Wednesday, uh, then sometime in the future. Have a wonderful day and go Rams.